about his experiences and the importance of fundraising and whatever else he's got on his mind. Well, it's exciting to be here, and uh, I feel really special. I, I thought almost I was coming to a CIA meeting. I was told and instructed there were no outside guests, and so I uh, sent all my credentials. I wasn't quite sure why Keith needed a check signed, but I did send that anyways. I, uh, I, I, so I, it may be that I'm, I've actually paid for this speaking engagement and uh, I'm not aware of it, but more, uh, than one way. more than one way. Yeah, and, you know, Keith's that guy that listens. We were at last year's... Um, Kentucky 4-H uh, homecoming, as we call it, and I noticed that the plaque was full <laughs> of uh, special recognition. It was the Dennis Goodman Award, and I said, well, the plaque is full. I said, where's the new plaque? He said, well, we need someone to donate that, and of course, you know, I, I said, in the spirit of 4-H, I said, well, sure, I'll take care of that, and, and the sucker sent me a bill for it, sure enough, so yeah. bless Jesus. <laughs> I, uh, a year later, that's how good a movie yeah, I got. Yeah, and, yeah, and he did remind me, literally said, hey, I want you to know that I remember you saying you would do this. And I thought, man, I don't know if I remembered saying that, but uh, I, do, I do believe in that, in that uh, extra effort award. It's what that award recognizes, and we want to see that uh, continue. But I, I'm just excited to be here, and I just wrote down some things that uh, I would share about basically what I call the, the, the who, what, where kind of stuff of my own life so you could – get to know me and see who I am. Uh, I certainly do love 4-H, and, and hopefully you'll see that. Hopefully by the end of my uh, short uh, presentation, you'll see what my passion is and uh, how my gifts and talents uh, and all my experiences uh, connect. My, uh, everyone's asking, you know, where are you from? My parents, uh, like many Kentuckians after uh, World War II and, and after the Great Depression, uh, needed a job. And so my parents uh, went to the Northland. They went to Michigan to find a job. And uh, my dad was 15 when he landed in Detroit. And uh, I often tell the, stru the true story is, you know, he lied about his age. He got a job. And, and uh, that's what he had to do, to send money back home to help the family. And, of course, after World War II, there were most folks were thinking because of what the government had done in terms of creating jobs, they thought we were going to go back into a depression again. So, you know, you think about, that day and that time, it was certainly uh, a different time set. And uh, depression is not what anyone wants to be in, nor do we want to be in a recession, but yet those things we, we uh, discover in life. I, I brought a book. It's, uh, it's entitled Stinking Creek, written by a guy by the name of John Fetterman. And it's basically a portrait about uh, where my parents grew up in Stinking Creek in Knox County. Uh, it's also where I live. This book was written in 1967. And for most who live in Stinking Creek, it's not anything that they want on their um, um, book, uh, shelf, collection. Uh, but I have it. Nevertheless, it's a portrait of one man's opinion, John Fetterman's opinion, of what he found in Appalachia and what it was like to grow up there. And... Um, you know, I, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about social media, but I believe it's so important for you as executive directors, of course, and for all of us. Just this week, I had a guy who uh, went on to uh, one of the social media things and started sending me a note and said, are you from Acorn Fork? And are you a Mills from Acorn Fork? And, of course, I am a Mills from Acorn Fork. I lived on Acorn Fork. It was Mills, Kentucky, 40970. It was where my great-grandfather was the postmaster, and his grandfather was the postmaster. And that was just prior after they came over the Cumberland Gap in the late 1770s. And so this guy sends me this note and says, is your father, Hobart Mills, who happens to be my grandfather? And, and he remembered my great-grandfather and said, when I was a little boy growing up, he said, your grandfather used to let me work for milk for my family and eggs. And he uh, went up north himself and retired from General Motors and now has come back and living in Clarksville, Tennessee, and says, I want to meet up. I want to tell you face-to-face -face the impact of your family in my life. And, you know, the truth is, if you knew where Acre and Fork is, if you just go beyond there, the only other place, not a city by name, is called Pigeon Roost. And so you'll know at the end of Pigeon Roost, it all ends. There is no more road. And for someone to come out of that spot and then find themselves having fully retired, now living in Clarksville, Tennessee, and connecting with my family, even through this little place called Stinking Creek that they may not be real proud of on this book, Fact of the matter is, it is my home. I'm very proud of where I come from and uh, never been ashamed to tell anyone uh, uh, that story. But my parents, uh, having left, 
uh, to go to Detroit. You can imagine Michigan in the 60s, I'm pretty sure. And it uh, wasn't exactly the place you wanted to grow up. But my family, uh, unique as it was, my mother, ha- her mother died when she was uh, very young, nine weeks old. And uh, she was raised basically by a multiple two of families, but had grandparents still living. And my mom and dad in 1971 decided to say, you know what, we're no longer going to live in Michigan. We're moving back to Kentucky. And uh, that was not exactly um, the area that I thought we shall probably move to. Uh, They didn't consult with me or ask me a lot of opinion. But in 1971, my dad uh, retired from General Motors there at the Fisher Body Plant on uh, 8 Mile in Detroit. My mother, who ran an insurance agency, moved back to Kentucky and opened up a furniture and appliance store. And it's amazing. Robert Frost writes the my family story most well spoken when he says two roads diverged in a yellow wood and sorry I could not travel both yet knowing how way leads on to way I doubted if I should ever come back my line I shall be telling this with a sigh somewhere ages and ages hence two roads diverged in a wood and I took the one less traveled by and it's made all the difference and I uh, have often asked my mom and dad uh, even in these later years of their life you know what really was their thoughts And I'm amazed at how many people tried to discourage them and said, oh, my God, you've got to stay on and work here. Your life is in the union. You can't leave this job. You're running an insurance agency. You you know, how many people said no? But my mom and dad said no to them and said, we want our children to know where they came from. And the truth is that I have family uh, still remaining in the Northland, if you will, and uh, they can't tell you hardly anything about their grandparents, my grandparents. We can spend all day long talking about my grandparents. When my parents moved back, I had five living great-grandparents. The oldest lived to be 98. And uh, we became such good friends, and I got to hear all their stories. You know, it's not every day you meet someone who was born in 1882, and they have a pretty good recollection of old things that some folks don't even want to talk about. Mm -hmm. And I learned so much history, and I learned about why my parents would have wanted me to come back, even though as a child I would have thought no. I was so grateful that they said yes. And I got to meet great aunts and uncles who invested in me. And um, I, I often say I was special, but I really was an oddity, because if you move from Michigan to Kentucky in the mountains, you got to know you're an outsider, even if you have a family lineage, that you can say, wait a minute, my people crossed over with Daniel Boone in the Cumberland Gap. It doesn't seem to matter. you got to work your way in. And I'm, lo- I'm really lucky to say after 40 years, I'm now a Kentuckian. But anyways, um, the fact is, though, that, that they gave me an opportunity to know history and to understand how it works and to understand people. And uh, my great-grandparents, my grandparents, my aunts and uncles, who all invested in me, shared with me simple advice. Simple mountain wisdom, you know, things you don't do. Like, you know, if you step in cow manure, you know what happens, don't you? <laughs> Everywhere you go, you're going to leave some of it, you know. That's pretty good wisdom, you know. It's, it's not the kind of thing that probably it makes for a good title of a book, but it makes a real good thing when you get ready to step into something that you probably ought to say, I don't know if I want to take that with me. My great-grandfather, uh, Nasby Benjamin Mills, always uh, used to give me these great one-liners in the I I went to him on a job opportunity, and I said, Grandpa, I said, I think this is what I want to do. He said, you think it's greener on the other side? And, of course, I knew what that meant, to be greener on the other side. Absolutely, it's greener on the other side. It's going to be a brick church, and there's going to be more money, and, yeah, it's greener on the other side. And he said, you know what makes that, right? (laughs) And I was just thinking, and my great academic education, I Couldn't figure it out to save my life. And I said, no, Grandpa, what is it? He said, honey, it just took more manure to make it greener. (laughs) You know, I've always thought about that. Every day of my life, I get ready to look at something. I go, I think that's better over there. And I think, do I really want to step in all that for it to be greener grass? I don't know. Simple wisdom. Uh, There were a lot of things in Michigan I loved, uh, and there were a lot of things in Michigan I did. You know, I I went to church in Michigan. We went to the first Free Will Baptist Church, and I often say Mama dragged me there. But anyways, but moving to Kentucky, I got exposed to uh, the things that I would have never, ever gotten exposure to. Yes, they have farmland in Michigan, and yes, they have agricultural work in Michigan. Yes, they have 4-H in Michigan, but guess what? I knew none of it. 
But when I moved to Kentucky, it was let's move on a farm and let's have some cows and some chickens and let's have a bull on this place and let's have hogs and let's bale hay and let's build fences. Woo-hoo-hoo! I think that's really good. I'm fired up. Thank you, Dad, for coming back to Kentucky. <laughs> uh, not exactly what I wanted to say at the moment, but today, oh, yeah, Robert Frost has me pegged because it was the decision my parents made that literally made all the difference in my life. It was because they moved to Kentucky that I was introduced to this program called 4-H. And I still have my first speech cards that I wrote out on little 3 by 5 cards. And uh, I remember my first speech. And I remember very well my first demonstration. And I remember well going to American Heritage. And I remember writing out that project book. And I remember so many of those things that I would have never, ever have experienced. I, I remember the first teacher that said to me, 4-H is fun. And when's the last time you heard that? I think it, those are the things that come to my mind as a grade schooler. I, I really didn't realize at the moment that my teacher was actually making what I call a formal recommendation for me to consider the advancing economical opportunities through the Cooperative Extension Service and programming abilities to develop my full potential. Doesn't that sound like something written up in one of your all's programs? Oh, yeah. You know? I, 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 I know that was the recommendation that she was making now. I didn't know it then, and, and I'm, I guess somehow or another I've worked through all of those fancy words to talk about what 4-H is. Uh, I didn't realize that 4-H was going to be this program for me that was going to help me explore uh, this ideal of this pledge. I, I'll tell you, I get pumped up on the 4-H pledge. I mean, it's amazing to me. I, I, I'm still amazed by it. I'm going to pledge my, my head and my heart and my hands and my health. The, the ideal that I would have a chance to explore through this uh, single journey all those opportunities, I, I've still yet am exploring things in my head. I, I'm still exploring these things that, that I have in my heart. I'm still exploring all of these things. I, my mind is growing clear all the time because of 4-H and because I've learned how to develop through 4-H clearer thinking. I mean, what does America need today? I'll tell you what we need. We need understanding in clearer thinking. It's nice to have that big formal recommendation word. But we need some people to say, listen, 4-H is fun. 4-H can make you a different person. 4-H, I credit 4-H for everything I am, everything that I understand. Oh, I, I'll give God the credit for all of that raw potential. But I give 4-H the credit for having to come along to say, through these experiences, Tim, of exploring your head and your heart and your hands and your health, you can make a difference, not only of clear thinking, but growing and the development of my mind. How many kids need us to tell them their mind can be developed? I mean, a lot of kids, I, probably my worst expression sometimes when I'm speaking to a high school class or a group and I ask some question and someone says, I don't know. I, I normally get fired up and become somewhat negative. I say, you don't know. What do you mean you don't know? You don't have an opinion? I don't know. 4-H taught me to have an opinion. Ask me about anything. I'll have an opinion. I'll guarantee it. I can tell you anything. I can talk to you about goats. If you want to talk about goats, we'll talk about judging roots. I can have an opinion. It may not be right. It may not be correct. It may not be uh, relevant for the moment. But guess what? I got an opinion. Because 4-H taught me that what I think, be it right or wrong, was still my opinion and until I was corrected or shown new evidence or explored the new opportunities to understand really what it's about, guess what? I could have my opinion. And oftentimes in 4-H, I learned to argue and debate. I learned to say, have you lost your mind? No way. <laughs> but I also learned how to say, it's the most unbelievable program ever. 4-H, um, because of my involvement in 4-H, really, it, it's made me a free thinker. I do challenge lots of things, but I think that's what we should do. Keith, in his introduction, was talking about J.M. Feltner 4-H camp. Uh, J.M. Feltner 4-H camp, given the land in Laurel County, serving about 14 counties. For as long as I had started going to camp and as long as anyone had ever remembered, there would never, ever been a swimming pool. I mean, we did have a pond, but we didn't quite call that a swimming pool. And twice a day, what the 4-H staff would do is they would load up all of us kids, we'd line up on the roadway, we'd cross over Highway 80, we'd go to Levi Jackson State Park, and we would go and we'd swim. 
And then we'd line up on that property, and they'd walk us back. Well, as you can imagine, moving 80, 160 kids, sometimes 250 kids at a whack. Unbelievable we crossed 80, and they were out there with little flags like it was going to stop the traffic, I guess. I, I don't know what they were thinking. But anyways, nevertheless, that's how we went swimming. And we took up two or three hours a day doing that just twice a day. And uh, when I was um, 18 years of age, the Feltner Corporation itself was struggling and battling with the University of Kentucky about who really owns the place and who's in control. And who, y'all, are, uh, I'm sure you don't know that battle. Yeah, no experience in that one. So in Kentucky, you know, that happens. And so here we are, we're in this midst of this battle. And, and, and I had been on the leadership council uh, of the uh, of the corporation, and uh, the guy who was going to be our next president, the vice president, uh, was unable and moved out of the area, and someone said, Tim, you don't mind to speak up, you do it. And you know what someone taught me early in 4-H, someone said, when you, get, when you take over a leadership position, what you have to do is you have to say, what's wrong, and let's fix what's wrong first, and then let's start working on new things. So the first thing I thought was wrong as an 18-year-old was, I never did like walking (laughs) over to Levi Jackson State Park. But I also realized at that age that it really was some safety issues. So I went to the university. I went to the executive director uh, at the university, and I said, hey, I said, what can we do? We, We actually need a swimming pool. And guess what? Everybody else had swimming pools. But them poor old people down there in southeastern Kentucky, I guess we're good enough. We just keep the pond. No. So I said, what do I need to do? He said, oh, Tim, there's no money in the budget. There's no money in the program. There's just no way that we can build a swimming pool. I said, hmm. All right. I said, let me ask you this question. I said, what are the real resources of the University of Kentucky? That's a good question to ask UK people, right? I said, we do have an engineering department, right? Yes. I said, you know, could engineers draw a pool? I mean, would that cost us anything? Oh, no, if you want an engineering plan, Tim, sure, we could get that done. I said, well, could you do that, Coleman? Please. Yeah, I can get you a plan. He did get me a plan. We figured out what the cost was. I went back to our counties, and I said, listen, if we figure this out, the number of kids that come, I mean, if you give $2 and you give $2 and you give $2, guess what? We could really make this happen. And I did raise $200,000. I did get Coleman to commit to give me $10,000. Took him to Lake Cumberland, so it was a lake trip and lemonade that got the first $10,000. But, uh, but nevertheless, it, it it was the start. And today, I will tell you, just this uh, year, I had some folks sending out some tweets to me saying, Tim, look at this swimming pool and how many kids are on the swimming pool or enjoying the swimming pool. And I don't know about you. It's been a long time ago. Swimming pool's up for a, a new renovation today. But I will tell you, never tell me that I can't do something because I'm pretty sure I'll either learn that I cannot do it because it's inappropriate to do it or not feasible to do it or it's not the right thing to do or I'll be happy to show you just how we can do it because if you believe and you see a need and you understand a need and you tell the need to the folks I believe that folks give and I discovered that as a youngster well 4-H has done so many things I I didn't realize that uh, when I joined 4-H that my teacher was actually attempting to give me life fundamental or life's foundation. I didn't know that. I probably would have been scared if my first 4-H leader would have said, now, Tim, I'm going to give you the fundamentals for the rest of your life. This is going to be really great. Maybe that's for good programming. But I didn't understand that, but I can tell you that that's exactly what they gave me. That's exactly what happened in my life. The, the things that I learned, those foundation, uh, that foundation were, were the things that they did that tapped into my skills. They saw what I liked to do and didn't try to tell me what I should do, and just said, all right, let's go do this. If you'd like to do this, let's do that. What other program in America, outside of 4-H, can you do whatever it is your passion is? Okay, you love goats? Happy, go, go, goats. <laughs> you like cows? Go, 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 cows. You know, If you like speeches, speech, speech, speech. If you like uh, demonstrate, if you like quilting, if you like canning, if if you like just going to camp, we you can major in camp. We got patches to prove it, right? <laughs> I mean, it doesn't matter. There is no other program like this. 
And, uh, and so I, I believe in the program because it, it, it connected for me not only my skill set and it not only developed my skill set, but it helped identify what my real passions were, what I was motivated about. It connected me with things. I mean, I had never traveled the rest of Kentucky until I joined 4-H. I mean, they said, hey, there's camps all over the state. Really? <laughs> well, I, I got to go see them. <laughs> I got to make some friends. I got to find out what happens, what, what goes on at these other camps. And thus it was because of those experiences that I learned what we didn't have and what we should have. And that's what happens every day. 4-H gave me the opportunity to become not only a leader for myself, but also for others. It, it tapped into my essence and my being. It, 4-H took and still takes individuals, and it gives us the ability through the programming to polish them and to shine them up. I, getting a white ribbon is as important as getting a blue ribbon. You've got to learn how to lose and how to overcome that adversity to be a real winner, to be grateful and gracious when you realize someone else is heartbroken. Uh, I, um, 4-H has taught me so very much. Yesterday, our nation celebrated 50 years of Dr. Martin Luther King's uh, speech on the Washington Mall. And I was thinking, you know, he, he had this great dream, and, and his dream was what? That we would not be judged by the color of our skin, but rather uh, the content of our character. You know, one of the things that I think 4-H does and that we should tap into more and more is that that is what we do. We build character. Look at you all sitting around this table. Now, some of you don't have character, but I mean, no, I'm just, <laughs> and I'm only talking to one guy in particular, and I'm certain you all know that guy, but the rest of you all, no, you guys got it. Some of us are characters. Yeah, some of you are characters, yes. Um, you know, the fact is that we are a character program. I mean, that is what we do with people. And, and look at what you've become. Look where you are. I mean, it, it, it may be sometimes simple. And we say, oh, I'm, I'm on a massive university. Okay, well, guess what? I know some folks who'd rather be, who'd like to be in your seat, even though you sometimes go, oh, my God, get me out of this seat. <laughs> I understand that. But you have achieved great things. Think of the impact uh, that you've been able uh, to do because of that. I, I think Dr. King spoke about character, and I think that's what we do in 4-H. 4-H is a fundamental part of who I am. It's the responsibility of everything that I am. And what do we do? We, we connect volunteers. We tap them in to our program uh, from everything from, you know, I went to out-of-state delegate programs. I went to exchange trips, area, district, regional meetings, state team council, area team councils, whatever the, whatever the terms we use. I, I've tried to do all of that stuff, and I've realized what the impact is, and it's massive and it's great. You guys, as executive directors, what do you do? You raise funds. You, make, you raise awareness. You educate people. You're actually a resource. Think about the programs that would not occur without you. Now, when you look at things sometimes as, as bad as some situations are, but you look at what would not happen if you didn't do what you just did, I'll guarantee you there are people that you're making life-changing differences in. And you will never get a chance, unfortunately, to have them tell you things. So, if you don't mind, I would, on behalf of the students in Oklahoma and in Alabama and in Tennessee and Kentucky and Florida and Louisiana and Mississippi and Arkansas, thank you. Thank you to the kids who will never get a chance to tell you you made a difference in their life through the programming that you fought to create and to keep funding. I applaud your work. Um, my role as a motivator is simply to encourage and inspire people. I always tell it it's really simple. I tell stories about people, places, experiences, and books. It's what I do. And uh, if I can't find it in those four resources, then maybe the world's come to an end and I've been left standing still. But I, I, it's there. It's what I do. I, I like to pump people up. I like to get them motivated. My goal as a supporter and a, as a believer in 4-H is to, first of all, encourage you guys as executive directors. I mean, your role is vital. And uh, you're out encouraging everyone else. Well, please let me encourage you to let you know you are making a difference. Uh, I came to Tennessee as an out-of-state delegate. You know what I mean? And I remember that conference. Yo, though different from Kentucky's, I remember it well. I went to Virginia as an out-of-state delegate to Blacksburg. And we'll never forget being on that campus. I mean, I had the experiences through 4-H that has literally made my life what it is. I, I, I applaud, you know, the workers of our clubs and our volunteers, and, and I, I share with them. When I go and speak with club leaders and volunteer leaders, I, I talk to them about what their importance is. But a lot of times they forget it. They forget the, the kid who's doing it right now and who has a job in government, who is a school teacher, who just got the school teacher of the year award, who remembers that, that uh, club leader who said, you can do it. My, um, 
my my work is really to awaken that inner spirit and to call people to action, or that's what I see myself doing mostly. Uh, I, I like to call people to service. I like to remind them uh, that this is a great time for them to be a first-time giver. I like to remind those who've given that it's got, this is a time to revive. Revive us again. Okay, I won't sing because I was told not to. But I, I, I think it's time to revive us. You know, I, mean, I think it's time to get excited. I think it's time to remind our politicians, our political leaders, the difference that the program makes. And, and if we need to parade people in front of them to say, hey, I just want you to know. And uh, maybe all they say is it made a difference in my life. It made a difference in my life. But I'll tell you what, after you get about 50 people saying it made a difference in my life, guess what? I'm kind of believing it's probably made a difference. And it has. It has. But it's, it's time for some folks to give again. My message to 4 Hers is real simple. This is the best time of your life. Take advantage of the opportunity you have because you absolutely have no clue how it's all going to come together. But as you know, it all does come together. You've got to learn how to overcome our setbacks. The pledge, I've already told you, it's my motivation. And I pledge my head to clear thinking. It pumps me up. I pledge my heart to grow to loyalties. I think about my passion and and the program, and I, I pledge my, my hands to larger service. I mean, I, God didn't give me these hands to uh, just look at. I'm supposed to actually do something with them. And if we need to be reminded that we're supposed to do something with our hands, that means get them dirty, get them involved, reach out and touch, whatever phrase, slogan we want to tackle. I, I mean, I think it's important because I made a pledge a long time ago that I still live every day. And uh, I, I think about my health. I mean, health is important. And uh, I like to eat. You're going to the stockyards. You're going to eat big. <laughs> I'm telling you, they got, they got eight-pound lobsters down there, just so you know. I don't know if you can afford one. Don't put it on the budget. But, but uh, that, one, that, that, that one will come back. And, uh, yeah, that one will probably bite somebody, uh, you know. So I may not order that one, but guess what? I like to do those things. But my health, I'm, I'm here to live for a reason. And I don't know when I'm going to expire, but guess what? I hope, it, I hope I go doing what I need to do and what I enjoy doing. I mean, it'd be pretty great. I was just in church Sunday, and there was a 96-year-old lady, and she said, uh, Preacher, I just came to hear you, which she's probably the only person in America who come to church to hear me speak. But anyways, <laughs> I was pumped up about it. And, and I said, well, man, I'm, I'm grateful you're here. And she said, a lot of people just can't do it. And she reminded me of something that I've often said in challenging some older folks who say, Preacher, you just don't understand. I just can't get to church. And sometimes maybe they just can't. I do understand that. But, you know, there are some people who just use things as an excuse. And I said, you know what the best thing that ever happened to you? And they said, what? I said, you die at church. Do you know what would happen if you died at church? I mean, I could preach. Glory be to God. They died serving the Lord. I can get fired up. I can get real <laughs> southern on that one. You know, I, I, I could share that they died en route to worship God. I mean, what kind of funeral would that be? Y'all are ready to give up an offering right now. I'm excited. You know, I said, that'd be great. But imagine, we've got hands, and in our pledge, it, it, we're, supposed to, we're supposed to get my health for better living so I can really make a difference. For my club, my, my Jerusalem, my, my community, <laughs> My Judea, my country, my Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth, the world. I think 4-H has everything that we need. And I think you guys are the perfect guys, the perfect ladies, the perfect team, the perfect directors to make it happen in America for some kid who's waiting to be inspired by you.